the best way to heal from this traumatic event, I think is, first of all, um, if someone is grieving, if someone has experienced loss, loss of a job, loss of health, loss of a loved one, to let them properly grieve. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people think death is the only thing we grieve. No. Hey family, this is Francis Germany, LPC, and you're doing Life with Lakeisha on Living Her Truth. Welcome to the Living Her Truth podcast, where we have honest conversations about what it means to live a purpose-driven life. I am your host, Lakeisha Wooder from LakeishaWooder.com, the place where women receive the tools necessary to feel seen, heard, and supported while pursuing their purpose. And now every week you'll learn those same tools through candid and transparent conversations. Miss Francis, thank you so much for saying yes to having this conversation with me today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for asking. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I like to start off every conversation. We're just talking about how I come to know the person that I am speaking with. And this episode is no different. And um, you guys, the way I, I met Miss Francis, I'm smiling because it was such a cool, such a dope way such an awesome way on how we on how we met. Ms. Francis and I have a mutual friend. Shout out to Mia. Mia, shout out. Yes, she's the best. You're the best. You're awesome, girl. We love you. Shout out to Absolutely. Mia. Absolutely. <laughs> Mia decided to do a celebration picnic for some of her close friends who have had something really fabulous happen or birthdays she just wanted to celebrate some of her friends because a lot of us we're all in different fields and we all have been doing something different and something amazing has happened so this was mia's way of giving us our flowers while we're still here like this is these these are her words to us you know absolutely and it came out of the blue out of nowhere she just Sent those attacks, right, Miss Francis? <laughs> yes, and it was so beautiful. I mean, it was the atmosphere, the company, the food, mm -hmm. everything. I mean, she was so thoughtful in preparing and putting it together. Mm -hmm. It was just a fabulous day. It was. It was a fabulous day. And you guys, you know that I'm always talking to you about building a support team that is going to support you at you know, while you operate in purpose. I talk about how it is so important. This is a prime example of why it's important because Mia took time out of her busy schedule because my girl is super busy. You know? Yes, she like, is. Mia oh is my doing God. all type of stuff. But yes, she found she time is. in her schedule to celebrate us because she knows yes. that every one of us is operating our purpose and we need to be celebrated for that. Like, these are the type of people you need in your corner. Now, Absolutely. Do we want to share a meal with them, Miss Francis? Do we want to share a meal or do we want to kind of keep her to ourselves? <laughs> no, she is so fabulous. She needs to be shared with the masses. It's yeah. so much of her to go around and she's just bubbling, just full of love. It is. She is. We love Mia. And, and like yes. the, the company was was great it was we all just got along and just started talking as if we had known each other it was just fabulous and you guys you know i live in houston texas and so it wasn't hot that day it was a nice day outside you know mm -hmm. we went to the park like where are we doing that so we was able to social distance you know from yes. everybody and just really have a good time and so um Miss Francis and I, you know, was talking where we all were talking, just, you know, getting to know each other. And Miss um, uh, Francis told me a little bit about her background. And I was just like, oh, Miss Francis, I need to get you on the podcast. So originally she was supposed to be on the podcast next year, but some things fell through and she was able to be on the podcast right now. So she's a perfect person to have this conversation about really healing from the pandemic. Because you guys, 
it's October. Like how many of you, and you know, go ahead and raise your hands, even though I can't see you, but how many of you just knew that the pandemic was going to be like a thing in the past by September? Mm -hmm. And that is, that is so not the case. And the pandemic has literally flipped all our worlds upside down, you know? And so I really want to just talk about healing from it because I truly believe that the pandemic is a tra is a traumatic it, traumatic event. But Ms. Francis here is a professional, you know, professional therapist, and so we're gonna really get her opinion about it. So Ms. Francis, let's start off. Do you think the pandemic is a traumatic event? Why or why not? Absolutely, it is a traumatic event. The definition of trauma is a deeply disturbing or distressing experience. And COVID-19 has been distressing and disturbing on so many levels, from kids to um, adolescents, teens, um, young adults, adults, seniors, all walks of life, people have been affected. Mm -hmm. So, and it has been extremely troubling. We've seen just an increase in stress, anxiety, depression, uh, suicidal ideation, loneliness, um, just in, in, of course, deaths. So it has been traumatic. So many people have lost so much with jobs, layoffs, mm -hmm. um, family members, uh, just loss of the norm loss of the normal way of life so it has been traumatic on so many different levels mm -hmm. i 100 percent agree and 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 just in case you guys are listening to us and you're like well you know nobody in my family or nobody that i know have been diagnosed with with covid it's still a traumatic event you know because we were scared to go outside we were scared to touch we were scared to touch uh touch each other family let me tell you something my husband woke up one day with 103 fever i i backed 50 feet up i was just like sir i don't know i don't know what's, and he's like but we've been living together i was like i don't care that doesn't mean i automatically have it if you got it like we social distance in the house like he had to literally go and you no know, i went i was like you know what you can have the bedroom you know, you can have, I'm gonna go into the guest room. Like, and, and that's just, you know, that's just yeah. how it was, you know? Absolutely. I mean, because 103 feet, we just automatically thought, oh my God, you, you got COVID. Yeah. Not even and, you know, taking into consideration that he was on a detox at the time and it was literally probably his body just detoxing. Right. And then allergy, allergies and sinuses and i mean i don't care where you are the first time you hear somebody cough you hear him sneeze you backing up this I mean, is <laughs> why be holding my coffee because i don't want nobody to think i got covid absolutely i mean the first time you hear somebody coughing and let somebody tell you they have a sore throat i mean you you know you back in 100 feet up away from them, you know, it's, it's just that fear, you know, um, afraid to go out. It's everybody all over the world could have a diagnose, a diagnosis of acute stress. It's been over six months. So it can actually even go into uh, chronic stress. Oh, wow because of what we've endured and all the different things that we uh witnessed and we've seen the threat of death we're experiencing the threat of death because for some people um catching covid could be a death sentence yeah. i mean and even with um you know if you're immune compromised but even if you're not because there have been reports of healthy people that have caught caught it you know, a recent doctor here in Houston hmm. passed away. A young, 28. Oh, no. 28 year old wow. doctor here in Houston passed wow. from COVID. She was helping, you know, those, um, you know, patients, and she contracted the disease herself, and, you know, she expired. Oh, wow. And, and, Man, that's so sad. And that's not the first story that, that we've heard. Because oh, no. Of, 
other, you know, pretty young people, 30 and, and younger, passing from COVID. Because when it first hit, you just automatically thought, you know, older people and yes. people who are immune compromised, you know, that were the uh, most exposed to, you know, or at the higher risk. But that hasn't even, you know, that hasn't even been, been the case. And now it's getting to the point where people that I know have been um, tested positive and people that mm -hmm. I know have come in contact with someone else who tested positive who didn't even know they had it because they was atheist. Like, it's just, it's just crazy. Yes, so it is. I'm looking at people a little crazy. I'm, you know, bagging up in a grocery store. I mean, that's, that's, that's trauma. That's trauma. It's yeah. absolutely. Wow. And those, you know, different reactions we have from the trauma you know, it, it, it heightens and, you know, highlights the stress that it have caused the whole world. Yes. Or uh, most of the whole world. Because there's some mm -hmm. people that still don't get it, still don't believe it's yeah. something that's serious as it is. And, you know, it don't matter what, they're not going to believe and they're not going to take any kind of precautions to mm -hmm. protect themselves or anyone else. Yeah, yeah. And I guess it's I guess it's their right. That's why we have to be responsible for for our own yes. Self, you know, so Miss Francis, what's the best way to heal from this traumatic event? The best way to heal from this traumatic event, I think, is first of all, um, if someone is grieving, if someone has experienced loss, loss of a job, loss of health loss of a loved one to let them properly grieve mm -hmm. you know a lot of people think death is the only thing we grieve no we um a lot of our kids are grieving right now because they've lost the old way of having school they've lost the old way of socializing they've lost and even adults too because we can't be as social as we used to be some kids can't go see grandma some people can't, you know, go see loved ones, go see friends. And so if they were um, a very social, if they were a social butterfly and they can't now, they've lost that. And so they need to grieve in a healthy manner because it, life is not as we knew it before. So we need to allow people to grieve how they grieve. Everybody grieves differently. And one thing I found out that you can't put a time limit on grief and you can't expect grief to be in a, put grief in a box and, and expect for everybody to grieve the exact same way. That's not reality. So my, my thing is that we allow people to grieve how they grieve. Now, when you get stuck in your grieving, that's when you need to come see a sister. Okay. Okay. You know what? I love the fact that you said that death is not the only reason why we grieve because that is, oh my God, that is so key. And I really hope that, that those few words have lifted some type of burden or shame off of someone who is grieving, even though they haven't, you know, lost a, a parent, a friend, or a close one to COVID directly. You know, because mm -hmm. like you said, you know, you can grieve the, the loss of your normalcy. Our children, like when was, like, have we even stopped to even think about how our children, you know, is possibly, poss you know, processing all this? I mean, it's hard for us as an adult mm -hmm. to process it. Because like you said, it's a lot of people, and when you say people, I'm pretty sure you mean, correct me if I'm wrong, adults who don't believe that this is, you know, a real thing, a real issue. Absolutely. Right? Yes. So mm -hmm. if that's mm -hmm. how we feel, but people around us is dying all the time, like you don't think the children are confused about that? You know? Absolutely. Yeah. You know. And so it 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 there's you know the kids, you know even with school going back and some going on campus, it's totally different. It's not the way it used to be. One of the kids that I was. Um, kind of prepping for him going back to campus and letting him know that it's not going to be so he's so ready to go back to school he's tired of the virtual thing he's so over virtual learning 
but I had to uh, explain to him, it's not going to be quite the same as it was when you were on campus before. You're still going to have the social distance. You're not going to be, you know, next to your buddy and be able to just, you know, candidly talk. You can't share your pencil. You can't share, you know, books. You can't share toys. Um, I'm not even sure how the playground is going to look, if they're going to be able to go on the playground. They're going to be, um, they can't go to lunch together. They'll have to eat lunch in their classrooms. Um, some may have, you know, a shield guard over their desk. It's not going to be school as usual. Mm -hmm. And so he asked me after I shared all of that with him, trying to prepare him for going back to campus, he said, what's the point? I might as well stay home. And that's our yes. Year. That's our year. And that's a nine-year-old. <gasps> yes. A nine-year-old saying it. A nine-year-old. You know, he's he was so hyped to go back to campus because he's missing his friends. And so many of the kids are, even though they're in the virtual classroom, they see their friends, but they can't reach out to them. They can't talk to their friends. So it's still a lot of isolation and loneliness in the kids. And so they're grieving that. They're missing that. They, it's a loss for them. And some of the behaviors are letting us know, you know, the, the kid is grieving. The kid is hurting because he can't, be around his friends. He can't, you know, um, play games with his friends like he used to. And so the, the, the kids are grieving. I was going to ask you about that. You know, what does grief look like in a child? Do you think it can look, it can come off as misbehavior, right? Absolutely. To, yes. Oh, it does. A lot of kids, especially trauma, trauma shows up in in behavior trauma shows up of of even in in physical ailments you know somatic uh ailments trauma shows up in so many different ways um what i do i'm a trauma-informed therapist so we um we make sure every kid that we see have taken the ACEs questionnaire that deals with those child those um, ACEs is adverse childhood experiences which are traumas and so every child that we counsel we um, put through that questionnaire and the average child on, on average it's at least four to five ACEs per student that we saw last year that's out of ten that's extremely high. Mm -hmm. So even before COVID, pre-COVID, kids were dealing with trauma. Mm -hmm. And the, the teachers were, were seeing the reactions of trauma in the classroom. And so sometimes we see it as the, the kid that's aggressive. Yeah. The kid that, you know, just sleep all day in class and don't want to participate. You know, that child might have been up all night because it was constant fighting and arguing at home the 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 child that's aggressive at school you know maybe um they see a lot of fighting at home and they come and act it out at school or maybe they're um they're on the other side of that aggression and you know they get that uh the the, the physical um abuse and so at school, they have, they come and they just, you know, they can't let it out at home. So they come to school and they let out that aggression. It might be that eloper, that person that runs, you know, and we do have a lot of elopers in the, in the elementary um, uh, grades, but they just run out of class. Well, sometimes it's because something has triggered them. Mm -hmm. um, a, 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 a book falling, you know, that loud noise, that's a trigger and they run or something somebody may say, you know, triggers them and they run. A lot of behaviors we see are not just, you know, the kids just want to act up and they, you know, are bad kids. No, they are traumatized kids. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know what, it, you, what you just said just proved my belief that I have said on this podcast before, which is that I believe the pandemic didn't create 
new problems. It just exacerbated. Absolutely. The that were already there. Yes. And that's why um, domestic abuse is going up. That's why child abuse cases are on the rise. It just have exasperated different things that were already going on. You know, because of COVID, we, we're stuck in the house. We can't go anywhere. If my abuser is in the house, I'm going to get abused more. Because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. now it's even more added frustration. frustration. Yes. And even the abuser is more frustrated frustrated yeah and so you know he has to take it the abuse and it's not just always a him but the abuser has to take it out on someone so it's whoever is in that household but one thing i've even found out about domestic abuse and um the, the the individual that's physically aggressive a lot of times they've been a victim of trauma They've endured some trauma. I believe it. I believe it. You know, I talk about how unresolved trauma, you know, affects our our decision, affects our actions. It affects every area of our life. Absolutely. You know? And some of us are out here and we're functioning. I'm doing air quotes for those of you who can't see me. You know, we're out here functioning by... Uh, ignoring this unresolved trauma and thinking that just because, you know, we're able to go to work and pay our bills that everything is okay. And it's just like, no, it's not. Because Mm -hmm. if you beat a lot of your child, it could be due to some unresolved trauma. Because just because you make six figures and you drive a Lexus doesn't mean that you don't go home and beat the hell out of your child. Absolutely. Or your spouse. Or your spouse. Yes. Or your spouse. Or your spouse. So how can we help you know, our children to um, deal with the trauma or grief that they're experiencing directly or or indirectly from this whole pandemic experience? First, as parents, we need to pay close attention to our kids. Mm -hmm. And as our kids are expressing their fears, they're expressing their anxiety, pay attention. And then allow... Um, a space for your child to get that out and and do not dismiss it this dismissing it only makes it worse for the kid allow that kid an opportunity to deal with it and if you can't help them as a parent call and get them some help Mm -hmm. we have to be proactive but allow that kid you know the opportunity to um you know, to talk about it, you know, we, we can't, it's no longer that, you know, that, that mindset that kids need to be seen and not heard. No, hear your child, hear them well, because a lot of times kids are crying out for help. They're crying out because they're in distress. Mm -hmm. So if we do not help them in their distress, that's another reason that suicide has, has gone up with kids because they feel hopeless and helpless because nobody will hear their cry. Nobody, Mm -hmm. you know, comes to their rescue. So Mm -hmm. we first have to pay attention to the kids, then get them, you know, active in different activities that'll help them, that'll, you know, um, uh, build up their self-esteem, build up, you know, uh, a social team, even if you have to allow your kid to be on a Zoom call with, two or three friends that will help that child if they're feeling isolated if they're feeling lonely like they have no social life I've dealt with a lot of that lately um allow kids that are feeling anxiety you know to 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 give them different coping skills help them give them some relaxing music give them you know an atmosphere to relax in help them exercise help them you know, do things to calm down. Yeah, yeah. And then if they're depressed, you know, help them increase the joy, give them some pleasurable activities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Those are, that is really good. And all I'm thinking in my head is, you know, in order to do that for the child, the parent had to be able to do that for themselves first. 
Absolutely. And here lies the problem. Here lies, lives the problem. Problem. Because so many of us are not even doing that for ourselves. Even if you don't have children, you know, I... Self-care. Self-care is self -care. so... Self-care. Self-care. You know, I'm, I'm in this, this space where I am questioning beliefs, beliefs that I've had all my life for one reason or another, right? To determine whether or not this belief is true or false. Is it serving me for where I am in this season, you know? uh right now and one of those beliefs is you know parenting is not something you can prepare for right but but my thing is yes it yes it is self-care practicing self-care practicing taking care of yourself right now you know um before you have children that's you preparing for parenthood because right. how can you be able to help your child and notice you the depression, the signs of depression, the signs of anxiety, the signs of frustration, the signs of overwhelming your child, if you're not even acknowledging it and healing from it in your own personal life. That's true. Because if you're not healthy, how are you going to help someone else to be healthy and whole? Mm, exactly. Exactly. And I, and I know it can be so frustrating when the children, when the children act out that you know, seen and not heard. Um, that has come up in my coaching sessions because you guys know I do self-awareness coaching. And that has come up in my coaching sessions where, you know, uh, it has affected, because when you tell your child that, it can affect them in adulthood and it can stop them from truly operating their purpose because they think they need to be seen and not heard. So you have women out here who not even like voicing their opinions, who are not even advocating for themselves because they need to be seen and not heard. And absolutely. So if we're like that at home, if we are ignoring our kids if they're not important enough for their needs to be met and that's one of the theories of attachment early on in life you know if we're going to have a, a secure attachment to our caregiver if we're going to have an ambivalent attachment to our caregiver the attachments that we have is it, it is it's determined by if that caregiver met my needs or not and so even as kids grow up and parents dismiss their feelings, dismiss, you know, their anxiety, dismiss their stress, they feel like, you know, what's going on with them is not important. If it's not important enough to my mom, if it's not important enough to my dad, am I really important? That's when the child becomes um, hopeless and helpless. Mm. that's when that depression, you know, starts to overtake them. You know, who, who can I count on? Mm -hmm. Who can I run to? Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, when, when I have something going on and that's why, that's how we can get secrets. You know, all the kids start harboring secrets because I can't go talk to mama. Mama's already told me that, you know, she don't want to hear it, you know, that I need to suck it up and get over it. You know, dad has said, be a man, man up. You, you know, you, you, you don't have emotions. You're a boy. You got to be tough. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. I've heard those. I heard those things all the time, which is so crazy because I, I think most times when it's said, it's, it's said with good intentions, like suck it up. You'll, you know, you don't have any emotions, like, you know, because to be honest, when you go out in the world as an adult, the, the world is not going to sugarcoat anything for, for you, right? So I can kind of get um, the attention behind that. But at the same time, you know, our children needs to feel like a whole person at home. So when they go out into the world and they're treated less than, they automatically can recognize the difference. Oh, absolutely. But also we have to make sure we're in touch with every emotion that we deal with we have to be in touch with our emotions because when we suppress those emotions they're going to come up again mm -hmm. but when they come up again it's not going to be healthy mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so it's better to deal with those emotions as they come and not suppress it 
because a lot of things that we suppress, we see later. And that's when mm -hmm. I get to see them because they didn't deal with them earlier. Yeah, yeah. Which is sad because therapy, um, if, if I can have it my way, therapy will be more of a proactive approach as opposed to a reactive you know, a, a reactive solution, if you will. But it's even becoming, some people are, ha, have become proactive in even when they see the first hint of, you know, something is a little off, you know, they come in so it won't grow into something mm -hmm. that um, they get stuck in and can't get out of. And, and so those are, sh are short-term solution uh, therapy sessions. You know what, that, that brings me, uh, that makes me, when you say that, it reminds me of an article that I read about Tina Knowles, because Tina, Miss Tina Knowles, yes, I'm talking about Beyonce, uh -huh. Mama, uh, mm -hmm. she put Beyonce and Solange in therapy when they was young to eliminate civil, you know, sibling rivalry because of, you know, Beyonce's career and, and what was going on. And she, in this article, it said that people like talked about Miss Knowles for doing that. Oh, like, brilliant. Do, not, do, not do that. There's nothing wrong with those kids or whatever. But she was taking a proactive approach. Now, I don't know Beyonce and Solange personally. I don't know what okay. their, you know, their sister relationship is. But the fact that Miss Knowles had enough forethought Yes. Like proactive approach. I thought that was brilliant. Brilliant. Like, why, Absolutely. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't Absolutely. You? you know, because Solange could have easily, you know, like hated her sister for having all of this success or what mm -hmm. extension mm -hmm. or whatever the case may be, instead of literally just, you know, leaning on her own natural talents and understand that she too is just as special as special as Beyonce. You know, right. I, Absolutely. Uh, I don't know. Like I said, I don't know them personally, but I just thought that that was, I just thought that was amazing. So when you said that is, it made that is that so, and, 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 and I'm quite sure it made a difference in Beyonce hmm. and how she, you know, her, her, how, how she's able to keep her demeanor. If you even look at how she's able to keep herself together, composed, no matter what, even I've seen um, videos where she may have t taken a tumble. She's able to regroup and keep it moving. Yep. Yep. All of that matters, even instilling her a mindset how not to get stuck in any situation. And I'm quite sure therapy really helped her with all of that. Mm -hmm. that's amazing that was an yeah. excellent um thing that her mother did i 100 percent agree i 100% agree now you mentioned emotional uh, uh being emotionally connected right and doing the emotional and mental work so give us some actionable steps on how to emotionally and mentally thrive during this pandemic the first thing which you even um I don't know if you realize when you were talking about how you challenge some of your beliefs, mm -hmm. I would say challenge some of your negative thoughts mm. that you may get because of the pandemic, because of the stress, because of the strain, because of the fear, because of the anxiety, check your thoughts, you know, are they real? You know, is it realistic? Um, is it, you know, automatically a negative thought? You know, challenge your thoughts. Um, as individuals, we sometimes can get into a pattern where we have automatic negative thoughts. Mm -hmm. And so with all the trauma that we're seeing and experiencing, we can get into that negative rut. And so all the thought, you know, the, the thoughts that we get are negative. Just like we, you know, after a while, that first person that cough around us, we think they got COVID. That's yep. an automatic negative thought. Yeah. And so I would say to check those negative thoughts, one, um, then I would say uh, to make sure we definitely do a lot of self-care. Mm -hmm. Care, mind, body and spirit 
work on our spirits as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. What are some um, self-care ways that we can actually do that? Because for a lot of people, when you talk about self-care, they, they think of going to the nail salon, getting their nails and their toes dead. Reading a book, mm -hmm. taking your mind off of work and everything else, just relaxing, relaxing, listening to, to some calm music, listening to some soft music, um, just turning off your cell phone mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for at least three hours. Mm -hmm. um, definitely turning off the news. I mean, no news. That's so you can get some self-care without any negativity because there's so much negative things we see on the news. Um, relaxing, taking a hot bath, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. eating a good healthy meal yes mm -hmm. eating properly mm -hmm. go and get some exercise getting out getting some sun um and then Absolutely. spending time with some somebody you love you know if you can in person zoom zoom call yeah facetime mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know which goes back to um having that support system that I talked about earlier, you know, because how mm -hmm. Mia got us together, you know, that is self-care by just putting yourself mm -hmm. around positive people who are, you know, still receiving blessings during this time as well, because yes, the, the pandemic is a traumatic event and we all have suffered some way directly or indirectly, but guys, there mm -hmm. are still people out here who are receiving blessings. God hasn't stopped giving, passing out blessings. That Not at all. You know, and we can lose, never will. Yeah, and we can lose lose sight of that, especially when we have one thing after the other coming down, one thing after the mm -hmm. other. So, getting around people who are doing something positive and still thriving, thriving, quote unquote, thriving during this pandemic, it, it just does something to your psyche. Because for me, it, it puts me in the mindset of, okay, so I'm next. You know, like there's still there's still hope. God is still yes. passing out the blessing business. Cause you know Absolutely. I'm I'm not perfect. Every now and again, mm. I'm like, come on, God. Did you forget about your sister? Did you forget about Absolutely? <laughs> we all get there. We all been there, done uh -huh. that. Mm -hmm. So that uh, reminder is always good. Mm -hmm. And then you guys, I want you to go back to the month of May on Thursdays because every Thursday in May I gave a tip on how to take a mental sabbatical even during social distancing that is having a mental sabbatical is perfect it's a perfect self-care you know, absolutely thing that you can that you can do to just literally oh. check out and to mentally like reset regroup mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I, one thing that I do also is like when I'm not working <laughs> I have um, YouTube prayers just going in my house. Hmm. Just um, Cindy Trim has a good one. Apostle John Eckhart, they have some absolutely wonderful prayers and for hours. Hmm. And it's just playing in my house. It's transferring my whole house. Even after I've worked in saw clients, I'll put those on. Wow. Okay. Cindy, what's her name? Cindy, Cindy Trim, T R I M M. Okay. Prayers on YouTube. I'm going to have to. Yes. I'm going to have to look that up because that's something else that can really be, you know, common into absolutely your in, your, in your faith. Because it's easy to lose faith when you are um, facing a traumatic event. Like yes, and stress after stress after stress. It, I mean, situation after situation. And not only through the pandemic dealing with COVID, but the civil unrest Ooh. has been traumatic in and of itself. And from case after case after case, we're wondering, Lord, how long? 
you know, I almost feel like we're the children of Israel. Lord, you know, when you're going to free us, when you're going to let us go, yeah. when you're going to deliver us. Yeah. Um, Ms. Francis, I think I stand in agreement with you on that. I, I think I, I think I stand in agreement with you on that. Um, because in a previous episode on Thursdays, because you guys know I do a moment of truth on, on Thursdays. And I talked about some of the things that I'm, that I'm doing, you know, personally to um, just recalibrate. And I, I talked about spiritual study. And so I told you guys exactly what it is that I'm studying personally and the children of Israel. It, it was placed on my heart to study them. Because I'm like, I need to study them because I need to understand and know why they never entered into the promised land. Like I, I need to know, because I feel like the answer to that question is going to set me free. So, mm. so I'm standing in agreement with you um, on that one, Miss Francis, because I'm, I'm literally studying that right oh, now. Oh, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they um, were very, it was very interesting, their whole plight. Mm-hmm the yeah. whole plight, even how they got into slavery, even to keep that slave mentality yeah. after they've been delivered. Yeah. And we have as a culture yeah. in so many ways, we yeah. still have that mentality. One mm -hmm. particular way, since we're talking about grief and trauma, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. one thing I've seen that kind of bothers me in the African-American church is about grief that when a, when, when we have funerals mm -hmm. and the death of a loved one, mm -hmm. it bothers me that we tell the families, oh, don't be sad. This is a celebration. Okay. Why? Why is that? Why do, why do you feel that way, Ms. Francis? Expound because on the Bible said there's a time and a season for all things. Death is a time to grieve. Death is a time to mourn. So as a former pastor and as a mental health clinician, I see that we give the families a false sense of hope. We give them to think that they need to be strong and not be sad. Mm. And so when they're, you know, when the funeral is over, when everybody is home and I mean, everybody's gone and they home by themselves, they're conflicted. Should I feel like this? Should I be sad? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, the preacher said that, you know, we celebrate that person and we do celebrate them, mm -hmm. but we still grieve. Grieving mm -hmm. is scriptural. It's scriptural. They had more periods of mourning in the Bible. Yeah, yeah. So in, to me, it goes back to a slave mentality almost that, you know, when, when, when um, traumatic things happened to the slave, they weren't allowed to grieve because it could have cost them their life. But we're free now. We can grieve. We can grieve. But we can grieve healthy. A funeral is a time to grieve. A funeral mm -hmm. is a time to cry. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we give mixed signals to families that are grieving. Mm -hmm. Telling them, oh, you know, it's a celebration. Yes, it's, we celebrate the life, but it is a time to cry. We're not going to see that person. It's a time to mourn. So because I've seen, I, I, I see both sides of it, I would like that to change, you know, some. Allow the families to grieve. Allow them to mourn at a funeral. Everybody don't have to shout. Everybody don't have to dance because somebody died. Then that's not a real expectation because somebody is hurt. Yeah, yeah. I never even thought about it. I never even thought about it that way. Cause I, I can I can't understand the intent behind saying let's make it a celebration, right? But it shouldn't substitute the grief. We still need to to grieve. Nobody said that we cannot celebrate the life, 
but right. let's make sure that we grieve the the, the process absolutely grieve is because the healing process it is and when you don't grieve healthy then you see that unresolved grief later on then that's when they come to me Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so as a clinician but as a former pastor mm -hmm. that's why i can understand both sides of it but i still feel that we need to allow the families to mourn allow them to mm -hmm. grieve in a healthy manner mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i can and i noticed that in the in the african in the black church wow I, I okay. I see your point, Miss Francis. I see your point. I'm gonna be see. This is why we have to be very intentional with our words and what it is that that we say, not just for ourselves, but for for other people, for other people as well. And this is also why we need to um, think for ourselves and act for ourselves too, um, and not just take somebody in a, a authoritative position not just take what they say as the gospel but you absolutely as a, as a guide to form our own thoughts and opinions i've noticed that um people are saying that they, they just want to toss 2020 they just want to you know toss it yeah you want to they just want to go 2021 come just come on come on mm -hmm. so my thing is i don't think we should toss 2020 right we still got time in this year there's still time you know for us to uh, do something productive and end this year on a positive note and since we have less than 100 days left in this year can you give us a few tips on how to end this year feeling confident and somewhat emotionally prepared as we can be for 2021 Yes, I would look at um, to I would look back at 2020 to learn any lesson that I could learn from it. Mm -hmm. What was the processes that I went through, you know, to get me to where I am? What do I need to do to take me forward into 2021 with the right mindset? Mm -hmm. Mentally healthy, mm -hmm. physically healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, spiritually healthy what steps can I take uh, make sure I'm I'm taking care of my mental um, reading good books reading you know self-help books reading um, whatever field you're in if you want to get better you want to get stronger you want to get more wisdom read a book on it yeah um, I would uh, make sure that I'm eating healthy, which will help us with our immune system to fight off COVID and, 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 and keep COVID out. Uh, make sure we're, um, you know, exercising, making sure we're resting. Proper rest is so important. I know anxiety has a lot of people having sleep issues. Depression affects sleep. Either you're going to sleep too much or not sleep enough. So making sure you get proper rest and then taking care of the mental, emotional, you know, it, it's okay to seek a therapist. Ooh. It's okay to seek a therapist. And on my Christian radio station, I say, it's okay to have God and a therapist. It's absolutely okay. If you see you're stuck in a place and you need to get unstuck, seek help seek professional help seek a coach seek a therapist seek somebody to help you get from where you are to where you desire to be um just even youtube and watch podcasts that will help encourage and motivate you to get where you need to be like living her truth <laughs> Thank you for the plug, Miss Francis. Thank you for the plug. <laughs> I love it. So, you guys, you you know that I am a huge advocate of of therapy, and I go to therapy uh, now. I was in therapy when COVID started, so the fact that I was already in therapy was just a blessing because I meet with my therapist every two weeks just to even just to talk about it. You know, so you guys know I'm a huge advocate of therapy, but. Um, but if you need a self-awareness coach to, to help you through it, then definitely contact me. There's a link in the show notes that you can click, click, or you can send me an email at info at 
calm because through self-awareness coaching, I teach you how to build that support team that you need. Because pretty much Ms. Francis was describing a support team, like you absolutely, team, you know, in place to help you to uh, emotionally and mentally prepare, and so we can confidently step into 2021. But uh, Ms. Francis, you are amazing. This is an amazing conversation. Thank you. Thank oh, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. The connection. It was yeah. awesome. It was. It was it was. It was very awesome. And thank you for being transparent because that's, you know, one of the, the values, if you will, of living of truth is to just be transparent and share our story. So thank you for being transparent about, you know, your dad's um, funeral, you know, because no problem. I mean, you know, I'm pretty sure somebody else probably experienced that same thing and probably felt some type of way about it, but didn't know if it was right for them to feel some type of way. So now you know your feelings are validated. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Your feelings are validated because that person is, is in the wrong. But before I let you go, please give us an audible recommendation or a book recommendation because you talked about reading a lot as, you know, one of the steps that we can do to prepare for 2021 and just to, you know, thrive during this pandemic. So give us one book or audible recommendation um, that you have read or listened to that have inspired you in some way. Um, <clears throat> Cindy Trim, YouTube, everything Cindy Trim. She is phenomenal. She's an author. Um, she's a pastor. Um, I love listening to her story, listening to her, um, her faith. And then another one real quick is Frequency by Robin Morris. That's if um, tune in, hear God, if you want um, to make sure you're able to hear him more clearly, Robin Morris is your man. Okay. But both of those, Cindy Trim and Robert Morris. Okay. And you saying Robert Morris? Robert. Yes. Robert Morris. He's a pastor out of the Dallas Fort Worth area. Okay. Okay. I'm going to have to um, link that. You guys, Audible Book Recommendations, click the link that says Audible Recommendations in the show notes and you will find it there. So one last question, Ms. Francis, when describing the meaning of living your truth, complete this phrase when you hear, you know, these two words put together, let me know what your third word is. Okay. Self-awareness, purpose, and process. Ooh. Okay. Okay. Process. Mm -hmm. Process. Um, we 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 <clears throat> realize that we have to be self-aware of who we are and know our purpose, but we also have to be aware of the process it takes to go through to get to our purpose. Ooh. Miss Francis. You guys say that again for the people in the background. Did y'all hear that? We also got to know the process. Say it again, Miss Francis. Yes, we got to know. We have to be self aware of who we are and the purpose, but also the process that has to occur to get us to our destiny. That right there should set somebody free because that process will throw you for a loop every single time. The process will have you thinking that you don't have purpose. The process will have you like having to reveal some stuff that you didn't even want to reveal, but you have to in order to build the strength and the courage and the knowledge so you can operate in purpose. That process, you guys. Ooh, the process. Mm, 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 mm. I've good. been so processed, so you know, I, 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 who, I, it's a book coming about the <laughs> process. It's a book coming about process. I've been processed, Ooh. processed. I'm definitely about to have you back on the podcast, so we can talk about that book. Yes, because one thing about it, God doesn't waste pain. God does not waste pain. Pain is just a part of the process. Ooh, God don't waste pain. Man. Absolutely set not. Me free. They didn't set y'all free. Set me free. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Francis. I appreciate that. 
Oh, no problem. No problem. Thank you again. Thank you again.